Well, welcome to more Coaster Con at Home fun with American Coaster Enthusiast. And today I am here with Jim Bow of Dutch Wonderland. He is the Director of Maintenance. And we're gonna get a little insight into Dutch Wonderland since we weren't able to visit this year. Um, he's gonna transport us there for a little bit of time to hear more and just whet our appetite for what's coming in 2021 that we get to experience, including that beautiful coaster right there behind him that you see. So good morning, Jim. I'm excited to have you. It's great to be here. It's a nice, beautiful day in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It is, and Dutch Wonderland is um, right in the heart of Amish country in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it's a family park. Will you tell me a little bit about what that means for y'all? What makes you a family park? You know, it really is a family park. Um, we moved, I'm a recovering Californian. I grew up in Santa Cruz, about two blocks from the boardwalk. And um, we've had, I have six children. And I've had somebody working here for the last 20 years. So my, my kids actually all started working here. Um, my youngest daughter works here now. And so I grew up wanting to be part of this park because as a parent, it was a wonderful place to have my kids working at as well as to have people coming as guests. And so we've, we've grown up bringing our children here as guests. Um, I've grown up here as a parent with my children working here. And the last uh, seven, eight years, I've had a chance to work with three or four of my kids in the park. Uh, so it really is neat. And, um, you know, it's a unique park because it, it is families that are coming. We're, we're geared towards two to 12 year olds. Um, you know, there's fun for everybody, but that's the age group that we try to cater to. And, you know, they're not troublemakers. They're not getting into mischief. They're just here to have fun. And it's, it's just really neat to see the, to hear the laughter and to see the smiles. That's the best part of working here. Um, and even for the employees, I enjoy working with our employees, which tend to be the, you know, a lot of the first jobs for kids. And I know one of my daughters started when she was 14. She worked here every summer while she went through college. And the first three or four years that she worked as a teacher in Lancaster, her summer, she still worked at the park as a supervisor. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great place for families on every level. Wow, that is. And you talk about getting the opportunity to work with your kids there. Tell us a little bit about um, your career in the industry. How did you end up at Dutch Wonderland? Had you worked in the amusement industry prior? No, I've got a really, I've come into this sort of the, the backwards direction. Um, everybody always tells me I always talk about airplanes, but yeah, I actually um, spent um, almost 15 years in the Air Force, and then I flew for American Airlines. Um, American Airlines had uh, some furloughs after 9-11, and uh, I got furloughed, and the um, short, short version is I volunteered for a week here at the park for a fundraising program that they had for a Boy Scout troop, and at the end of it, um, was uh, working with one of the managers who ended up being Rick Stammel, the, the general manager at the time. And he found out um, we were talking about my background in the Air Force and as well as flying airplanes, I was trained as an accident investigator. So I have a safety background and I have a degree in safety. And so um, they hired me as a consultant. And so I worked here for about a year reviewing all of the operations and maintenance procedures and, and worked in the park as a safety observer and safety consultant. And, Oh, a year or so later, they asked if I wanted to take over the maintenance department. And now I have to deal with all of those procedures that I helped develop way back when. Um, so yeah, I sort of fell into it. But um, it is interesting because the flying world actually is very similar to the, the inspection process, the maintenance process we do is, is what we do for amusement rides. And um, you know, the airplane I, that I used to fly in the Air Force cost about the same amount that Dutch Wonderland cost when it was uh, purchased from Hershey. And so you know, cost-wise, it was very similar, but also just as an amusement ride, an aircraft has hydraulics and it has pneumatics and it has electrical systems and electronics. Uh, prior to every flight, we go out and we do an inspection on it. We document the inspection. And so um, if you actually look at the Dutch Wonderland inspection documentation, it is very similar for some reason to the process that we use on airplanes as far as how we track uh, troubles and, and, and the maintenance that's done on it. So uh, I'm not sure how that carried into our system, but it, it works really well. That's great. What an interesting story to hear that difference in how um, you were able to reinvent a career and find something else you love too. 
and, and again, I mentioned I grew up in Santa Cruz near the beach boardwalk and, um, you know, we would constantly hear the roller coaster and stuff going. I never worked at the park, but I always wanted to work at a park. And when I actually got out of the Air Force, in addition to applying to a bunch of airlines, I actually had sent my resume to Hershey to their safety department, hoping that there might be an opening. And if they had happened to call, I would have gone there first, but uh, it went the other direction for a little while. And so here I am. That's really interesting that you ended up back there. And what a great reason to have done it, to have been volunteering for Scouts. I love that. In any case, I've never worked for a living, so, you know. <laughs> oh, that's the best life we could ask for. You bet. Yes. So um, we see one of your coasters behind you. Indeed, Merlin's Mayhem. Yes, y'all have three total coasters. And this is the most thrilling of your coasters. Is that how you would describe it? I find it that way. I, you know, I know your all of your members are not going to want to hear this, but I don't really like wooden roller coasters. I'm getting too old. They shake me to pieces, and uh, um, I love Merlin's Mayhem because it is such a smooth coaster. Um, if you ride in the front seat of this thing and you go over the top, um, there's nothing in front of you. And, you know, it's got one of these lap bars. It's not a shoulder bar. It's across your lap, and so there's not. Feels like there's nothing there. Um, it swoops, it looks and feels very close to some of the fences and obstacles and I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's hard not to pick your feet up so you don't kick something when in reality, as you know, there's a lot of space. Uh, I do remember when we were doing the test runs on it, the, um, you know, we have one of these eggs that we hang on the track and it makes sure we have all the spacing and there's, there's more space than you need and you can't touch the walls as you go through the tunnel. But, it took me six tries before I would actually leave my arm all the way out as I went through the tunnel to see if I could touch it. Um, I knew you couldn't, but it's that close. It feels like you will. So yeah, it's a thrilling coaster. I really like Merlin's Mayhem. That's my favorite. That's nice. And tell us about your other two coasters. So um, we have the, um, the Joust, as we call it, which was the prototype Gold Rush coaster from Chance. Um, as, as I recall, it was purchased after the IAPA show uh, by the Clark family. Um, brought up here back in uh, 1998. So that's our, our little kitty coaster, which incidentally has a longer ride than Merlin's Mayhem, only because it goes around the track two times on each cycle. Um, but uh, so that's, um, that's our first one. Uh, we can have kids ride that that are as, as small as 36 inches. So uh, that's generally the first coaster that they're able to ride. Um, then we have the Kingdom Coaster, which I'm sure many of you know started out as, uh, as the Sky Princess used to be a, a, you know, a, a white coaster. Um, then it was repainted under Hershey and renamed the Kingdom Coaster because a lot of boys didn't like riding the princess. And so that's part of the reasoning behind why it got, uh, got redone. And so you gotta be 46 inches to ride that. It was built back in 92. Um, really looking forward to getting people in the park this year to see it because uh, Bain and Painting did a wonderful job repainting it for us here. Uh, while we were shut down, we've completely repainted it, so it's got a nice shiny fresh coat of paint on it, and it looks spectacular. Um, and then we have uh, Merlin's Mayhem, which, as you know, was built in 2017, so we'll be going into its third year of running it this year. Um, and that one uh, is uh, 39 inches, so it's the, you know, its claim to fame is uh, up in this area. It's the first suspended coaster or inverted coaster that a child will be able to ride. Um, and it is very, very secure. We actually added some redundancies to make the guests feel more secure. Um, it was designed not to need a lap belt, just a lap bar. Um, but it's also a very deep bucket seat that you sit in so that uh, when you get in it, you're not going to slide out. Or you've got to work your way and climb out of the seat. But so we added the lap belt because it makes people feel more secure. I know talking with SNS's engineers as they were designing it, one of the things they did to test those seats was they, they brought several of their children in and they put them in the seat and then they would stand in front of them with a candy bar. And if they could get out of the seat, they could have the candy bar. And nobody won the candy bar that way. They all got rewarded, but they, they didn't get the candy bar for climbing out of the seat. So that's some of the high tech testing that has to go into a roller coaster. It's funny you mention that because uh, we had an interview with Gravity Group last mm -hmm. week and they mentioned almost an identical story to try to lure a child out of a safety restraint with candy yeah. it's the new but, industry you know, standard <laughs> from, from the safety world that's one of the things i know and it's actually one of the most frustrating things as a safety person when something happens because you spend so much time and effort trying to think of all the ways that somebody will do something and they always come up with something you don't expect 
So, uh, you know, that's it. And, and one of the best parts in this industry and what I enjoy from the safety world where, um, you know, in the flying world, we want to prevent accidents. Uh, we actually, we don't call them accidents. We call them mishaps because accidents happen. Mishaps are preventable. And so we always want to prevent everything. And so we, we try to learn from that. And so even more so in the park. And that's, that's what I love about this business. It's very similar to the flying world where we go to these conferences and safety seminars and all of our competitors, we're all there sharing information because we all have the same goal, which is we don't want anyone getting hurt. You come here to have fun. You, you want to be scared. You want to have a thrill, but you don't really want to think something's going to happen to you. And that's what our job is, is to make sure that everything is as absolutely as safe as possible and to protect ourselves from ourselves sometimes. Exactly right. Trying to predict what someone will think of. I can't imagine that challenging piece. And yep. Your role has taken on a whole new safety um, piece now with the pandemic of COVID-19. Y'all are not open yet, correct? You haven't opened That's correct. We're making preparations for it. We have to wait for the, the state to lift some of the restrictions. Um, but uh, yeah, we are actively getting everything ready. We've got all kinds of procedures. And um, you know, we're doing everything that we possibly can to, to keep everyone safe. It doesn't do any of us in the industry any good to go into a park and find out that everybody gets sick going to whatever the name of the park is. It's going to affect all of the parks around the country. So, um, again, that's been a neat cooperative effort, particularly up here in Pennsylvania. Um, we actually have a weekly phone call with all the members of PAPA, the Pennsylvania Amusement Park and Attractions Association, um, sharing information and procedures. And it's, it's very much standardizing things we've learned from each other. But it's been, it's been very rewarding over the last couple of months as we all get together and share ideas and suppliers and, and sources of materials and the way we're doing procedures. So we're gonna be ready. We just need to make sure that everybody feels safe to come to the park as well as to actually be safe. Absolutely, and you're exactly right that that is a big piece of it, is feeling safe is, is just as important as being safe. Exactly, exactly. Yes, and but what great camaraderie to have that support system because we all talk about um, how we've all survived and the mental health issues around COVID-19, but having that support in your job also, um, it's great that you've been able to lean on each other and brainstorm and figure out how to make this all happen. It is. And it's, it's really been that, that camaraderie is, is really the best word to think of, even if I can't pronounce it. But um, it, it has been really, it's been a support system, I guess, is what it is, as, as all of us have dealt with something that there's no manual out there for. You know, normally you can go back and look at past history of, of how we've done things or how you deal with an issue on a ride or or guest behavior, and I'll tell you what, there isn't anything on this. And I know we've had people in these discussions that are from over in Europe, we've had people in the discussions from the Philippines, and just trying to pull worldwide from everybody's information to, to get the best practice to find out what works, you know, and, and hopefully we've, we've got enough of the right things. And nobody's gonna agree with everything that's being done, but we're just trying to do the absolute best that we can. And in, in any case, we try to err on the conservative side. That's nice to hear, and it is. I mean, I'm excited to get back out to the parks and start venturing into our new normal of life. Um, mm -hmm. I hope won't be a new normal forever. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I'm trying on that one for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's an exhausting new normal. <laughs> but you know, even technology-wise, there's some neat things that have come up. Um, everybody's familiar with Ralph Alberts for, for the padding on just about every ride out there. Um, about a month or so back, um, they actually have a, um, a material that can impregnate in the padding itself, which gives it a, a, an anti-germ, antiviral type of protection. If I wanna say it's silver nitrate, maybe, I don't remember if I'm remembering exactly what it is, but so it's actually embedded as opposed to something that we have to spray onto the ride every time. And so although it won't be 100% prevention for any germs, you know, you're still gonna have children that choose to lick things or whatnot, mm -hmm. but it certainly will inhibit that and will be in addition to the cleaning and sanitation procedures that parks are going through. And so uh, it just happened to be our sky ride, uh, all the lap bars were in for, for recoding this year and uh, the timing was perfect. So when the lap bars get back here next week, they will all have this, this coating and the padding for it. And that's something we'll be using moving forward. So things like that, uh, applying technologies that have been out in the, the healthcare industry. Um, you know, there's certain sprays and sanitizing and disinfecting type of chemicals 
and procedures and processes and equipment that now we're finding, hey, we can adapt those into the amusement park environment um, to, to quickly sanitize large areas. Things that have normally only been done in hospital settings before. So um, yeah, there's solutions out there. It's just been things we've never looked for before. Right, you didn't have to. We all just washed our hands and took standard precautions. Exactly, exactly. Good. Just not enough anymore right now. Cleaning solutions we typically get in spray bottles. I have 220 gallons of, of disinfectant sitting outside my office. So, you know, we're prepared that way. And uh, hand sanitizers, same thing, you know, hundreds of gallons of uh, sanitizer refills. So uh, it's just things we've never done before and, and we're going to be ready with it. That's wonderful. And, you know, talking about safety, we've talked a little bit about um, what you do in your role. Tell us what a day at work looks like for you. What are your responsibilities? Sure. For me personally, or I don't yeah. do much as everybody tells me. You know, my my job we we joke about my job is to find the money for everybody else to spend and to to build the schedules. Um, no, really, my my role I'm responsible for Dutch Wonderland as well as the maintenance of the Cartoon Network Hotel, which is one of our properties here. So um, I'm doing a lot more of the budgeting and making sure we have the resources that we need. Looking long term at projects that we're working on in the future, which is one of the fun parts of this job is to be involved in what we're going to be doing in two years, three years, five years down the road, and then working through those as they come to fruition. You know, Mayhem was the first large project that I was involved in from the, the concept side. And I look back at all the different types of coasters we considered and how it actually turned out. You know, that, that's been very fun and rewarding. Um, but then as far as our department, um, you know, on a typical day when the park is running, a park opens at 10 o'clock and our day normally starts at six in the morning and uh, we have a set of mechanics that will come in and inspect all of the rides prior to opening. So in the state of Pennsylvania we're required to do a an inspection by a state certified inspector once a month. So um, about two-thirds of our mechanics have uh, have the experience and have been able to get the training they need to pass the test and are certified as state inspectors. Our younger mechanics, as they're working towards that, um, you know, that's their, their learning on the job. It typically takes them about two to three years before they'll be ready to pass the test. But in any case, that test or the inspection that we're required to do on a monthly basis, we do that same inspection every day. The, the difference being is that once a month it is done by someone who's a certified inspector and documented as such. Um, and the inspections, they vary. Um, Merlin's Mayhem, for example, takes a, a little over three hours to do. There are several hundred items. We actually break the checklist down into three inspections, one for the train, one for the track, and one for the station. Um, and it takes, uh, it takes at least one person a little over three hours. Kingdom Coaster, very similar to that. Um, and again, there are hundreds of items that get documented, and if one of those items doesn't pass, the ride doesn't run until it's fixed. And so we have 35 rides and attractions in the park that get inspected every morning, so we have to get all those done. Um, I'm kind of excited this year. Uh, the timing of all the virus and things is, is making it a little more of a challenge, but we are transitioning this year to a digital uh, checklist system. So all of our inspections are actually tracked on an iPad right now, um, which is nice. It lets us look, uh, a mechanic can instantly at a ride pull up all of the manuals on a ride. Um, if he doesn't know how to fix something, he's got the manuals with him as he's working on the ride. Um, all of the inspection items, if he's not sure what if it's a grease item and he hasn't done it for a while, he can look at a picture that'll show him where the, the grease zerk is and it'll tell him what grease to use. And so uh, it really streamlines the process and it certainly in my world makes the paperwork a lot easier to, to take care of. Um, so yeah, so the guys will work on the rides you know, for four hours. Um, nothing ever breaks in an amusement park, but uh, you'll have those mornings where, not, I should say, one thing never breaks in an amusement park because if you have one ride that has something break it seems like everything you're supposed to inspect will break so there are going to be days when things open late um, but otherwise on a normal day after the four hours the park is up and running uh, we have two or three mechanics that are on call if there's an issue unlike some parks all of our mechanics are trained to some level on every ride so they're available on call each of our mechanics has a has certain rides that are his primary rides that he's responsible for the major maintenance and overhauls on, but as far, and they have a training process we go through, they have to be certified for any ride that they inspect and any ride that they work on. So as they gain experience, they can do more and more. And so we have two mechanics at least on call, 
And then after their eight hours is up for the second half of the day, we have two more mechanics that come in and they will also be on call during the day. A little bit different now with the hotel, our mechanics also, we have mechanics at the hotel. We have maintenance teams at the, at the campground. It's also part of Dutch Wonderland. Um, and so from time to time, if there's an electrical issue, for instance, we have the certified electrician that's part of the, the, the parks maintenance team, but we support the hotel, we support the campground. Same thing for plumbing and carpentry and painting. So it's, it's really one maintenance team and each one has a primary area they work in, but we move them around. That's, that's kind of it. But the, the best part about every day, no two days are the same. And that's what I really like. Ah. Having been in the flying world where every day was a different view out my office window, I've never had a job where I do the same thing every day. And, and it is kind of nice now because, um, you know, it's always something different. Um, the other thing is managers, what we do is we take turns uh, usually four or five times a month where we'll be the manager on duty. So we're supervising the entire complex's operations that day if there's any issues. And uh, I enjoy that the most because I get to be out and talking with the guests and uh, typically we'll walk. I quit wearing a pedometer because I got too tired, but it's about 10 to 12 miles we usually walk on a shift. That's a great point. That also gives you the chance to get out and get that rewarding feeling of reminding yourself why you do everything behind the scenes you do. That's exactly right. I always pick the afternoon shift when I can because it's when the park is open as opposed to the morning when we're just inspecting rides. I very much enjoy being out around the people and, and I really like working with our, with our employees too. Again, we have all the way from older retirees or senior seasoned employees, but I really enjoy working with the 14, 15, 16 year olds that are, that are learning and getting some life experience and they're learning responsibility and that you have to show up on time and you have to do things the right way. And it's, it's fun to be able to watch them grow and learn over the course of a season. I bet you see a big change in them from beginning to end. Oh, certainly. I mean, even the interview process, I love doing our interviews for our new hires and the, you know, talking to these kids that it's their absolute first interview. And if you can get them to go from shaking and sweating and they're completely nervous to just get their personality to come out and, and that process as they gain that self-esteem as they work. I think of my, my oldest daughter, hopefully she doesn't listen to this, but you know, she, when she also did internships at Disney and after starting at Dutch Wonderland, she actually went on and got a degree in recreation management and worked at Disney, Disney World. Um, but one of the jobs she was given one year was to work in their, um, whatever the crowd control position is called, where you're standing at the lines and trying to keep everybody doing what they're doing. And it was absolutely terrifying for her because she was always very quiet and shy. Her favorite job of all the places she worked there, five different roles, was that job. And she would always pick up extra shifts to go back and do that because she gained that confidence of dealing with the guests and learning how to get people to, to do what you want them to do without yelling and screaming, you know, and to have, have fun with it. So those are, those are neat life lessons. It certainly helps her now as a mother with two boys, you know, to, to try to keep them under control. Whole different wrangling situation there. <laughs> and tranquilizer darts are not allowed in either situation. <laughs> So what is most challenging in your role that you tackle there in the park? Or was there a specific time that was the most challenging for you? This may be it. <laughs> yeah, which, which item? No, there's, there's always different challenges. This year, certainly, it has been dealing with the virus and the uncertainty of it. Um, not, knowing, not knowing an opening date, not having a target date of when we're going to do that. I mean, that's been a challenge this year. Um, <laughs> Merlin's Mayhem. Um, you know, it had its own set of challenges that year. It had its personality. And as things always go according to plans, that was all going to be done during the winter when we we're shut down. And uh, as you may or may not know, there's a, there's a central column that loops around. The column weighs 30,000 pounds, and it's got another tens of thousands of pounds of arms connected to it. And that was supposed to be mounted to bedrock. Well, when we did our geologic surveys, of course, the bedrock there was about 45 feet underground. And so what we ended up, it also happened to be where a pond was. So we had to, the pond that had been there for 50 years. So we had to drain the pond. We had to get out all of the fish. Uh, we spent about two days getting the fish out, relocating the fish to, uh, to a carp, not a carp farm, a koi farm. Then we had um, about nine feet of mud that had to be excavated. And it ended up, there is a 
concrete mass that is 30 feet across and nine feet thick that is about 300,000 pounds of concrete because we couldn't get to the bedrock, it wasn't practical. Then you go to the opposite end of the coaster where it goes underneath the train track through the tunnel um, that had to go down about 12 feet. And of course the bedrock was about four feet below the surface. And so things like that kind of delayed things. And so now we were building a roller coaster while the park was open, having these cranes with essentially jackhammers on the end, breaking up the rock because we couldn't do any blasting because everything else had already been built in place. So uh, figuring out how to get dump trucks, cement trucks, tractors to go through the one entrance that they could do, which happened to be across two of the main walkways in the park. It was fun. It was a challenge. Yeah. But, you know, Dutch Northland is pretty small and it's a limited area. I um, can't even imagine. You know, but one of the things that I've really enjoyed, and, and we have that same sort of a vibe right now as we try to prepare the park under these unique circumstances, is we seem to have a crisis of some sort every couple of years, and meaning a natural disaster type. The, the back end of the park is an island and it's, it's a lot lower and there's a stream that runs around it. And since I've been here, we've had, um, we've had two floods that have put it under four or five feet of water. And the most frustrating one was when we added the, we have our animatronic dinosaurs back there. And uh, it looked beautiful. We redid the whole island. We made our exploration island. And uh, just several weeks after we did it, we had a freak storm off to the east that it, it created a flash flood. And in a matter of about two hours, we went from no problem to over four feet of water over the island. So we had dinosaurs floating around. We were out there at two in the morning. We found out the dinosaurs float. Um, so we had to, all the electronics were underwater. We were pulling dinosaurs out. Um, our turnpike cars were out there, stripped off all of the landscaping that had been done. And what was so neat to see was that where we thought it was going to be weeks before we had it back in service, we had the island open again in two days because of all the employees that were willing to come in. And it was just like ants crawling around out there doing all the cleanup and the landscapers. Everybody took so much pride in what was there. They wanted to put it back the way it was. And, and I find that very rewarding and very unique here at the park. Um, I've seen it at the campground when we've had a windstorm knock down branches. Um, I've been out of the campground in the middle of the night helping campers move when it's flooding. Um, we saw it with the hotel getting things done where we have a hotel staff, but the park staff jumps in and helps. And going back to your original question about the family, that's Dutch Wonderland really is a family. And, and that's, I don't like the crises, but it, it's always really neat when we have those experiences to see how people do much more than a job here. They do it because they really care about the park. That speaks so highly to the culture there too, that they want it to be beautiful for the guest and for getting it the way that it was supposed to be. That is simply amazing to pull together and do such a huge project so quickly. You wow, know. I can't imagine floating dinosaurs and how devastating <laughs> to have just done all that work and watch it get destroyed. Nothing like watching the tail of a stegosaurus about 20 feet out into the river and I found out that stereo wire is strong enough to reel it back in. <laughs> I also oh, look this, you good not to turn your flashlight too closely because all of the bugs and spiders are floating too. <laughs> Gosh, what an adventure. You bet. That's what it has been. <laughs> yes, but, that's, but you're right. Parks go through these phases where natural disasters have a big impact on you. You're an outdoor um, facility, so you're going to be impacted strongly by that. You bet. And, you know, the park, um, as you've seen, if you've been here, it's, you know, it started out as farmland. And about, uh, you know, when it started in 1963, it, trees, lots of trees got planted. And it's one of the wonderful things here at the park is how many trees we have in the shade. And, uh, you know, we've had some challenges. The, uh, the ash borer has been going through Pennsylvania. Um, I had 37 ash trees in the park and I'm down to about 17. So mm -hmm. just keeping up with replanting trees in their place, but monitoring the status of the trees, treating the ones that we could treat to try to keep them alive. Um, you know, that's been a challenge, but you know, we're constantly having to look over our heads at the tree branches. And so we have uh, normally three tree trimmings a year that we go through um, specifically looking for things that might not be as healthy as they should. And, and I hate getting rid of the old trees, but we, we hit that point where some of these trees are getting towards the end of their life. And so we're trying to be proactive to, to plant the new ones and keep that same feel here at the park. Even as we update the park, 
Dutch Wonderland always has to feel like Dutch Wonderland. Um, you know, we have people that come here because they came as a child and now they're bringing their children and they're bringing their grandchildren. And, and that is really kind of fun for these, we call them the legacy rides, uh, the Wonder House and um, some of these, uh, you know, these silly scenes that we have, the Amish quilting people and the little dolls that you used to see back in the, in the early 60s. Well, we want to keep that here because that's what people remember and they can talk to their kids about things that they did. We'll always have Bossy the cow that you get to milk, um, things like that. That is an important aspect that you bring up, but there's a challenge that comes with that of keeping those legacy rides running. Have y'all started running into the fact that you can't get parts and the support you need for those rides? No, as long as we got Amazon and eBay, we'll be in good shape. Um, no, but it's true. Our our oldest ride that I have a date for goes back to 1954, our Skyfighter ride. Um, we have a Mangles, um, the, the Kitty Whip, the, the Wonder Whip ride, as we call it, that we're not really sure of the date on. It goes back so far, but, you know, we can establish that it's back in the 50s at least. And uh, some of these rides whose manufacturers have been long out of business or they sold to another company that then went out of business. Um, we do do, we have some wonderful local machine shops that we have relationships with. Um, and, I, and I say it not in jest, Amazon and, and eBay have been a wonderful resource. We had a control unit that we had to replace last year on the Joust and that, um, that set of electronics went obsolete about 15 years ago and they stopped uh, servicing it about eight years ago. And on eBay, we were able to find one and we had it in two days. Um, so, you know, it's amazing what you can find out there. Um, Chris Culp, my, my maintenance manager, is a genius at finding things, um, you know, finding all these little widgets that you need. And if we can't find them, sometimes we just have to go and make them. We have done upgrades to some of the older rides, um, adding, uh, you know, PLCs, uh, programmable logic controllers on them. Um, so they're still the same old ride, but maybe they start a little bit softer, um, you know, adding different or newer motors on them, trying to do that. So uh, the experience is the same or, or better. It certainly looks the same. Um, and then there's a lot of, you know, there's inspections and it's in light of some things that happened over the last couple of years, corrosion inspections is something that is, there's a whole new aspect of how that's done. So every one of our rides we do, uh, ultrasonic inspections on all the structure to, to monitor any corrosion that may or may not be developing and keep track of that. So um, yeah, the older rides are kind of fun. You know, I came from the Air Force and we're flying airplanes that were built uh, back in the 1950s. So as long as you take care of things uh, and do it properly, you know, you can keep them going for a long time. It just gets harder to find the parts. That's a great point though. Mm -hmm. And then Looking at the other side of that, you got to really get a taste of the shopping experience and the building of a new ride with Merlin's Mayhem. What's your dream project to work on now that you've been in the park for a few years? Dream or nightmare? <laughs> it probably fits um, both. <laughs> I gotta say, Merlin's, Merlin's Mayhem is probably as close to it as you could come. I know we're, we're, we're doing some things coming up. Uh, we've got some new things coming up in the next couple of years. Um, that it's kind of fun to be involved in those. Um, but, you know, Mayhem, it really was neat because I can still think back to sitting around the table in my office as we were discussing names. And, uh, you know, Merlin's Mayhem name, I remember when that name was tossed out. And, uh, you know, so we came up with the name. That's the most important part, obviously, right? You have to have the name. Um, but I remember talking with, um, with several of the vendors and seeing the different, it's kind of neat to have seen the different options of coasters to have ridden the, um, the animated versions of what was initially proposed and then seeing what we did. And I still remember the very first time I rode Mayhem, going up that hill, looking around, thinking it looks just like what I saw on my computer because everything was superimposed previously in our park, you know, and so we'd ridden that coaster before. Um, but that was, that was, it was very rewarding. Um, I have a degree in mechanical engineering, but I'm not an engineer. Um, I guess that safety is what I, my field was, where you look at why things broke. You don't have to design it correctly, but I can understand engineers and I can understand what they're doing and I speak the same language. So it was neat to work with real engineers and to, to see the extent of the planning that goes into these newer rides. Um, to be involved in the, the, the testing of it and certifying of the ride, because that's kind of what I did in the Air Force. Part of my job for a while had been testing new equipment. And so it was, it's been neat to do that and to work with them. As you know, Mayhem is a prototype. And so there were some, some growing pains, but 
Um, some people might got a little more concerned about it, but I've been through that process many times before in my military career as we would develop new technology and new equipment. And that's what we did. And I found that very rewarding. And, and that's why I really like that ride too, because having seen where it was, the obstacles that we saw, how we overcame those obstacles, how the ride ended up being themed as opposed to how we had originally conceived it. And there's always compromises and changes, you know, so that's been, that's been fun. And so if I was to have a dream job, it would be to do another mayhem type of ride. But um, I'd probably get bored if that's all I did. So really, it, who knows, it might be bumper cars or it might be another kitty ride next time. I don't know. And the hotel is new for y'all this year. And it's the that's first nice. of the Cartoon Network themed hotels. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So the uh, first Cartoon Network Hotel, um, it had been a previous hotel, motel type of building, and then, so it's been completely completely gutted and redone. Um, all the rooms are themed with cartoon characters that I didn't recognize. So we actually had a year of training to try to learn uh, who the Powerpuff Girls are, and that they're not Powder Puff Girls, but they're Powerpuff Girls. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have a brand new resort swimming pool outside with a slide. Uh, we actually got the, uh, the slide and the water all turned back on yesterday. And so there's an outdoor splash pad at play area, as well as an indoor pool. Um, there's a, there's going to be, I forget the cartoon that goes with it, but fire rings for outdoor camping type of cooking your marshmallows, a um, movie screen for outdoor movies at night, and um, all obviously all cartoon character. Uh, the big surprise for me was the um, the restaurant, which is heavily themed, and the menu, which are all themed after cartoon characters and cartoon shows, and the food is first rate. It is a real restaurant. It's not like corn dogs and, and chicken nuggets, and certainly there's kids' items on the menu, but I've been there several times with my family just to go out to eat at a restaurant because it's very good. And, it, and it's a blast. You sit there in the restaurant, and if you're looking at the wall with the window into the kitchen, it looks like it, it's all HD TVs and there's the cartoon characters in there cooking your food for you and having some escapades. Um, you can watch the elevator go up and down, but it's not the elevator, it's the TV screens. And so you've got penguins and polar bears or whoever going up and down in the elevator. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And you know, that's another one of those experiences. We talked earlier about, you know, if you want to enjoy sausage, don't make it, you know, don't be in the process of it. Um, there's a lot of work, and by the time you know a couple of years had gone by, about two years of the whole process, I remember being up there and watching these. I just happened to be going by a room as the family was opening up the doors, and just hearing the children squeal as they go into the room, and they're looking at all the little details that were in there, and how much fun they were having. It was like you know, it's not just a hotel. This is something special, you know, and they really enjoyed that. So we're hoping to get that back open again really soon too. So. Uh, it's been shut down for the virus as well for a, a couple months, but we should be up and running very soon. I know you'll be excited to hear those squeals going throughout the hotel and the park again soon. As long as they don't break anything. Yeah, no breaking. <laughs> you've, you've done, you need a little bit of time to get settled again after all the work you've done during the COVID. I mean, the coaster looks beautiful. It's nice that you were able to take the time of this closure to get the coaster painted and get some infrastructure taken care of, I'm sure. Yeah, there were certainly advantages to some of the time. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the grass at the hotel. The freshly seeded grass is looking beautiful now because nobody's been running around on it for a little while. So, no, it has. And we've taken advantage of it. Uh, the front of the park, um, when guests come in, you'll see that um, we, we took out all the old pavers and we have a, a, a new entryway when you come in. Um, so a little bit of a new look as you come in. Uh, the castle itself uh, got a little bit of a facelift. It's all been freshened up outside. So... Um, yeah, I think people will be pleased when they come in. It'll it'll be different, and uh, we'll see where we go. But uh, it's it's going to be a good year. That's it, and it's clear you have a ton of passion for what you do and being part of the park and the memories y'all are helping make. Are you an amusement park fan yourself? Do you love rides? I do, and it's you know I guess I never understood it when my parents didn't want to go on rides, but now that I have. Uh, um, seven grandchildren. I like watching my grandchildren go on rides sometimes more than me riding all of them. Um, you know, some of the, the hyper coasters and things, you get one of them out of me. 
I flew airplanes for a living. It took kind of some of the fun out of the roller coasters, I guess. I like things that are smooth, as I said. Wooden roller coasters beat me up now. But um, I do enjoy the, the amusement park environment. And as, I, as I've become elderly, I find that now I enjoy the shows sometimes more than the rides. And, you know, but I really, really like taking our kids to the parks. And face it, this is a great job. It's got great side benefits to be able to visit many different parks and call it work. Um, you know, and get paid to go visit parks. But what I really do enjoy is watching the kids, especially my own kids, have them go through those experiences. And I'll tell you what, as a grandpa, your grandkids really like you and work at an amusement park. It's even cooler than being a pilot. <coughs> it's hard to believe. But... That is amazing. I mean, what a great thing to come visit grandpa at work. What a dream. <laughs> you bet. You betcha. Yes, Jim, this has been great insight into Dutch Wonderland and the industry. Um, I hope everybody watching really enjoyed it. I truly enjoyed talking to you and hearing your stories. Um, thank you for taking your time out of your day to share a bit with American Coaster Enthusiasts and be part of CoasterCon at home. Um, we can't wait to see you in person in 2021 at CoasterCon 43. Well, Elizabeth, my absolute pleasure chatting with you. I can't wait to see all you people in person in three dimensions instead of Zoom again. But um, And certainly when your folks are here, even if they're not here as part of the convention, track me down. I'd love to, to show you some of the behind the scenes stuff if somebody's interested in seeing it. They're always welcome to do show and tell. Thank you. We do. We always love seeing what drives our hobby on the outside. We love to see the inside of it too. My pleasure. Well, we'll see you soon.
American Coaster Enthusiast, and welcome to another CoasterCon at Home feature. Today, I'm here with B. Derek Shaw, one of your fellow ACE members, to share about the history of Dutch Wonderland, a wonderful family park located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that we were supposed to be visiting on Tuesday of CoasterCon 43. Um, so sadly, we can't be there, but we look forward to be there in 2021. And we hope you enjoy this preview of what you're gonna to get to enjoy a taste of in 2021 at Dutch Wonderland. So Derek, I am so excited you're here today with us. Thank you for taking the time to do some research and learn more about Dutch Wonderland to share with all our viewers. So tell oh, us- terrific. Good. I hope you learned something and had some fun facts that you found too. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, this is actually the youngest park of all four that we will be visiting. Uh, it got started uh, before it got started. A farmer by the name of uh, Earl Clark built the Congress Inn. It was a 52 room hotel along the strip in uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country in Lancaster. And in 1962, he, he made so much money, he said, Well, I want to turn this into something different, something for kids to enjoy. There was no kind of entertainment venue for them at that time. So the winter of 62 into 63, uh, he had a 14 acre park, spent nine months building the park. Central to the whole thing is the uh, wonderful castle that people will enter. You cross the gift shop and then you pass through there to get into the rest of the park. Uh, it opened May 20th of that year, four rides. Uh, the Wonderland Special Train, uh, the Lady Gay River Boat, the Turnpike Car Ride, and Antique Cars, and the Whale Boats. Um, there were no ro roller coasters early on. There were some unique rides though, like the Upside Down House, which many of you probably uh, visited at Arnold's Park and, and some other places. It's basically a very early version of a haunted swing that you've seen at other uh, major theme parks. They have a Wisdom Astro Liner from 1970s, and one time they had swan boats too. Um, they also have a botanical garden and a wax museum based on local history. Unfortunately, that uh, is now uh, part of an employee operations building because uh, it got so big they had to uh, find space for them because uh, the park has a lot more than 14 acres now, but still it's tight. Um, they kept adding rides due to popular trends, the monorail in 1966, a, a big slide later that decade, and a log flume in 77. Interestingly, as a way to finance the monorail, uh, traversing the parking lot, and into the park, they sold off a chunk of land that was theirs on the corner, and uh, it became a, uh, it was built as a Ramada Inn, never came through with that, then it switched to Continental Inns of America, which had re remained that way until March of 2018, when they bought the property back. This time, the third owner of the park bought it back, brought it back into the Dutch Wonderland Complex, so it's, it's now in its original form, the way it uh, was. Coasters, the first one was 1992, and that's Sky Princess, first project from Custom Coasters, 55 feet tall, 2,000 feet long. Uh, it was renamed Kingdom Coaster in 2007 because the young boys did not want to ride Sky Princess. They said, this is silly or, you know, as little boys would think. So it's now the Kingdom Coaster, and it's, it's served everyone very well. A great uh, wood coaster, PTC Trains. And uh, the one quirky thing, it's just the way the plastic, instead of uh, wood, it's plastic, the, the uh, floorboards and the railings, and like a plasticized plastic, wood. Looks like wood, but it isn't. And if you touch it, you might get a little shock, a little stack electricity, but that just enhances the ride, I think. Uh, right across from it is the Joust, and the Joust is a small chance ride. It's, it was their uh, demo ride for their, uh, their uh, prototype for their Big Dipper coaster. So it really complements the wood coaster, which is a, a pretty big deal. And then the smaller coaster for maybe some of the kids that want to uh, start working up. 98, uh, I mentioned was Joust. And um, then later on, it, it went through a bunch of different sales. 2001, November of that year, Hershey Entertainment Resource Company purchased the park from the Clarks, Merle and Earl Clark. And uh, they had the park for another nine years, 2010, November of that year, Palace Entertainment bought the park from Herco. So it's gone through a, a bunch of hands. 2012, half of the gift shop, which is a huge gift shop, that entire castle first floor, was turned into called Merlin's Kitchen. Um, 2018, July 27th of that day, the park went to paid parking for the first time 
to help alleviate incoming traffic on US 30. People trying to get into the park would create long lines on the highway. So they said, we need to do something. So they kind of looped the traffic around the perimeter of the parking lot and added some toll booths. And it's, it's worked out to, to keep traffic off 30 and into the park, which is the important thing. The biggest thing that most people uh, at least heard of, 24th, 2018 is when Merlin's Mayhem opened. Merlin's is an SNS Worldwide custom family inverted coaster. Um, lots of drops, turns, helices. Um, it goes underneath the railroad track in a tunnel. Uh, just a fun little ride uh, with big scale thrills. And that also has a storyline. So when kids enter, they're not uh, just riding a ride. They are participating in the story as they go through it. And they try to help uh, Merlin save the kingdom. That really been very popular. It's caught on very quickly. Uh, they put it on the exact spot of the original turnpike ride. While there is no turnpike anymore, uh, it's in the center of the park. So as soon as you walk in past the castle, this big yellow coaster just boom right at you. You're right there. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, the park was 14 acres. It's up to 48 and it has 38 rides and attractions. So it's becoming fairly large. Duke's Lagoon Water Park is named for a purple dragon costume character. Uh, a bunch of different mascots. Duke the Dragon. The park also has Princess Brooke and the Safety Knight. So they've got a lot of different characters strolling around. The complex also includes Wonderland Mini Golf and the Old Mill Stream Campground. So those who might be attending convention and want to camp, it's right there. You can walk to the park from there. And of course, uh, well, a five acre island at the back of the park called Exploration Island. That includes a prehistoric path featuring more than 15 animatronic dinosaurs. And of course, the biggest new thing, the reason they bought that land back after the original owners sold it, is to convert the Continental Inn into a brand new one. And this is the first one for the Cartoon Network Hotel. It's a themed resort hotel uh, with all the Cartoon Network characters. There's special rooms. You can get large rooms with, uh, that uh, will house up to eight people. So it's a really, really nice uh, destination hotel right on property. You can walk from the campground, you can walk from the hotel to the park, right on property. That's so fun, Derek. It's great to hear about Cartoon Network. That's one that you don't get to be immersed in that theming very often. It is very new. This is the first one that they have done in partnership with the Dutch Wonderland Palace Entertainment. They opened uh, in January, but unfortunately, uh, the COVID-19 thing came along, so they're temporarily closed. I'm sure every, there'll be many that want to experience that hotel during um, CoasterCon. Now, looking at all those wonderful rides that have been through the years, um, I know some of our members love roller coasters, and I'm sure they're excited for those too, because sometimes these family parks can be a tough credit to get, mm -hmm. or we well, should say an expensive credit to get. Yes. <laughs> and Dutch Wonderland is a pay one price to enter park. So Correct. many may not have gone. I enjoyed a visit with my kids when they were young and I have very fond memories. As soon as you said the castle, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember. It's just a great immersive experience when you go in that park. Um, but so of those old original rides, um, I believe the log flume still operating. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And they have a gondola sky ride that goes over the park. Mm -hmm. But the monorail's gone, right? It is, um, yes, it is, yes. I had to think for a second. I know, I, uh, I couldn't remember it being there still. Something, really, something uh, they took a tilt-a-whirl and now called a turtle whirl because they are, the, the back of the, uh, uh, the uh, compartments that you ride in is a turtle shell. So it really makes for a fun, different tilt-a-whirl experience, the turtle whirl. And of course, the, the haunted swing house, the upside down house is, is still there. It's, it's very small, but it was really the prototype for what followed afterwards. Hmm. That's interesting. And for someone who's not been on one, what is, um, a, what is an upside down house? You caught it at an upside down swing the, uh, or reverse swing? Uh, it's basically, uh, you're sitting, you're moving a little bit, but the entire room moves on top of you. It's like you're in a barrel and, and the barrel is moving and you're not moving much, but you think you are. So it's a very effective uh, uh, way of, you think you're upside down, but you really aren't. It kind of confuses your senses. 
Now that you say that, now I remember what upside down house is. I remember the one at Carowinds oh, sure. when I was a child. That was one of my favorite rides because my mom really did think she was upside down and freaked out every time. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'll try it this time and hopefully you won't freak out. I know, I'll definitely enjoy being back on one of those. I, I rode one at another park, not last season, and I can't remember where that was. But of those other original rides, what is still, what else is still around? Um, anything stand out as a ride that everyone's going to be itching a ride that's not a roller coaster? Um, just if, if you're into not, uh, <clears throat> the Astro Liner is um, a simulator early version of a simulator. They have a brand new simulator right near it. So you can try the old ways and you can try the more modern way too. They're right beside each other. So that's kind of fun. That is. Um, the park has a lot of unique things like, uh, and uh, it's, just a, it's, it's just a nice fun place to be. Uh, I think they still have some of the feeding the animals and the petting zoo kind of thing. So uh, that might be an opportunity as well. And I remember a few shows that were not completely um, children only marketed shows. I remember a diving show that I really enjoyed. It had a great um, child theming to it. Um, I haven't been there. But I remember a great diving show. I don't know how evolution of shows have gone. There may be something different there, but I, I always appreciate that shows are something that they seem to market that the um, adult and child can enjoy. Exactly, yep. Uh, I believe this uh, high diving show is still there. I'm not positive. It's uh, been two years since I've been there. Okay. Merlin's Mayhem opened, so uh, they might have switched things out a bit. Yes, that's exciting. I haven't had a chance to go for Merlin's Mayhem yet, so I can't wait to go in 2021 to ride it. I didn't realize they had the very first custom coaster. Yes. That was built by them. Yes. Yep, that's number one. So they sent a lot of people to Dutch Wonderland, to Lancaster, to take a look at it so they could build uh, other projects elsewhere. That was kind of the impetus. And through the years, you mentioned a couple of times that they were, that they took prototypes of rides. Was that something that seemed apparent in their mission that they were willing to take that risk in a sense to take on the prototype ride? Or um, do you think that was intentional or they just like the newness of it? I think the opportunity presented itself I don't think they were out seeking prototypes, but uh, it was the right fit for the park at that time, and they went with, with the fit. Okay. Very and interesting. A, a couple other things. They have a, a couple shoulder seasons, Happy Hauntings and Dutch Winter Wonderland. So they've entered the fall and winter seasons as well. Uh, interestingly, uh, Amusement Today readers and um, park connoisseurs voted Dutch Wonderland, the best family uh, park of 2019. And it's won that award previously too, or placed very high. So it's, it's, it's well received by people worldwide. They're really a kingdom for kids and, and they do it well. Sounds like it. And it sounds like they have a lot of variety. Yes. Uh, and most of the rides are not marketed as, uh, or designed for it to be a child's ride, but really a family ride so that the adult can ride with the child. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. Yep. So that the, the, uh, the child and the adult can enjoy the experience together and talk about it and share that. So through time, uh, we know that COVID-19 has had a horrible impact on the park. Prior to that, has Dutch Wonderland kind of just had to keep moving along just like all the other parks with the switches in the economy and such, no major um, impacts on them from weather related incidences or other things that had a big impact on the park's development or temporary demise? No, they seem to be uh, very successful in spite of what goes on around them sometimes. And part of that is a lot of people come to Lancaster County to visit the Pennsylvania Dutch. And when you're there, you need to do Dutch Wonderland. That's all part of the experience. So they have a built-in tourist market. And even though uh, COVID-19 is with us, I think uh, a lot of people are going to be doing a lot of uh, So rather than going across the country, they may go across the state or, or uh, maybe come up from Maryland or, or down from New England to do something. And Dutch Wonderland provides that opportunity along with the rest of Pennsylvania Dutch country. 
And that's a great thing to note that when you do visit Dutch Wonderland that day for CoasterCon 43 in 2021, um, it's worth saving some time in your schedule to enjoy and savor the Amish countryside and take in some of their um, wonderful food and features of their lifestyle. Oh, absolutely. Gotta have some shoe fly pie and uh, chicken corn soup. Absolutely. Um, such a treat to get to come to that area of the country. I'm excited to attract everybody to and get to visit with everyone next year there. Mm -hmm. Anything else that stands out about Dutch Wonderland that you is of, believe is of interest? <clears throat> How one person with a, a dream, a vision, can uh, put together something that is a unique experience that continues to grow and thrive. It's been 57 years, I think, if my math is right. And it just keeps on going and going and going. They've gone through two different owners, but each one has taken it to a different level. And while it it's, doesn't look like the original Dutch Wonderland, totally, there are some things, it still maintains that unique flavor. It's still a kingdom for kids. That's their main uh, mantra, and they are doing a wonderful job of preserving that every day. That is wonderful. What a great visit we're going to have next year. I can't wait to experience the park with everyone. It is fun. It's a, it's a kingdom for adults, too, especially coaster adults. Absolutely. Two very nice coasters to enjoy there. Yep, for sure. Three. Three, that's right. I yep. keep forgetting that there's a third coaster there. Joust. They have the Joust. And Kingdom Coaster and, of course, Merlin's Mayhem. Very nice. And amazing for such a small park. It's a, a triple credit. That is. Triple credits. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Wonderful. So can't wait to see everybody at Dutch Wonderland next year and the rest of the uh, convention. It's going to be a real good time. We'll show you some uh, good hospitality. 